Greetings from the Petersburg Church of Christ. We thank you for allowing us into your home today, and we encourage you to open your Bible and follow along with the message that's presented today. We would also encourage you to take notes and send us any questions or comments that you have concerning today's message to the address that will be provided at the end of the lesson. We invite you to join us any opportunity that you have. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock and Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. We also have a midweek Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. We are located at 205 Russell Street, just off the south side of the Petersburg Square. If you have your Bible handy, please turn to the ninth chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. A subject that needs to be talked about from the Word of God. A lot in the Bible on it. I didn't know that for a long time. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 beginning at verse 1. For all this I considered in my heart even to declare all this that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean and to the unclean. To him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not, as is the good, so is the sinner. And he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun. That there is one event unto all. Yea also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil. And madness is in their heart while they live. And after that they go to the dead. For to him that is joined to all the living there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more a reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love. And their hatred. And their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. That gets your mind gripped with what is the Bible talking about. What is this one event that everybody on earth will experience? The rich, the poor, those who sacrifice, those who do not sacrifice. What one event is Solomon talking about here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9? He's talking about the fact that all human beings are going to die. We may not like to think about it. We may not be aware of what the Bible has to say about the subject. But we need to be aware of what the Bible says about it. My purpose today is to undo some of my early preaching when I taught things that I didn't know anything about. Different ones would react to me and then they would say, well, Brother Burns does not believe certain so-and-so things about when we die and go into the next world. So I got thinking about it. I got studying. I got to digging into what the Bible has to say. Will we know each other in heaven? Very interesting question. Now we made a, a clear statement at community Bible study in the last couple of weeks. Concerning Psalm 139, 17, Psalms 119, verse 160. The sum of thy word is truth. 
If you take Job 14 by itself for scripture reading for Bible study this morning and you don't consider nothing else in the Bible on the subject, you won't have the truth on the subject where we know each other in heaven. If you take the passage in Matthew the 22nd chapter and Luke chapter 20 and we want to turn to that. Both renderings are basically the same. We want to look at Luke's rendering of this idea. That some people confronted Jesus. And I guess they really thought they knew what they were talking about. They were trying to trap Jesus. But yet they were trying to get an answer to a question. And in Luke chapter 20. And let me say this, if you take Luke chapter 20 beginning at verse 27 and you don't take anything else in the Bible on the subject, you won't know the truth. The sum of thy word is truth. You've got to take what the Old Testament said. You've got to take what the New Testament said. You've got to take what Jesus said. You've got to take what the apostles said. You've got to add up all of these truths and then all of a sudden you realize... I didn't do that. And I came to some erroneous conclusions. And I've tried to straighten that matter out as the years have gone by. In Luke chapter 20, beginning at verse 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. And they asked him saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. There were therefore seven brethren, and the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her to wife, and he died childless. And the third took her, and in the manner the seven also, and they left no children, and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he calleth the Lord, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. And that was a passage I only considered on the subject years ago. And I concluded very prematurely that there's not going to be any marriage in heaven there's not going to be any given giving in marriage there'll be no flesh and blood in heaven and thus concluded right quickly that we will not know each other on the other side but then I started reading some more Bible I started thinking about that position. And all of a sudden it hit me right between the eyes. There's a whole lot more to this subject than just Luke chapter 20 and Matthew chapter 22 where they both give practically the same rendering of this passage of scripture. So we want to tackle this. We'll try to be as honest, sincere, and frank, biblical as I possibly can be. Because I don't want to give my theories about anything. I want to go to a thus saith the Lord and let the Bible speak 
and draw necessary conclusions to what the Bible has to say about this. Well, let's do so. Uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Did you ever read this? In Matthew 8, verse 11, Jesus was talking. He said, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Did you hear what they said? Where are the people going to come from that are going to go into the eternal kingdom of heaven? Jesus said from the east and the west. In other words, they're going to come in every direction. Well, what about the next phrase? Who are they going to sit down with? Abraham. Isaac and Jacob and where is it that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are going to be in the kingdom of heaven in this reference he's not talking about church he's talking about the eternal expanses of the kingdom of heaven after this life is over and people have come from the east and the west and guess what it says? It says they're going to know who Abraham is. They're going to know who Abraham is. They're going to know who Isaac is. They're going to be identifiable. You'll be able to recognize who they are. Hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? In other words, <clears throat> the identity of men like Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac is going to be retained after you leave this world you're going to be the other side if that's not what it means what in the world does it mean that's exactly what it means uh, well one akin to that just a little bit <clears throat> but a little bit different uh, look at the 17th chapter of the book of Matthew and look what's going on <clears throat> first three or four verses and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them <clears throat> Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Who's Moses and Elias here? Been dead for years. Moses and Elias were in the background here when Jesus was transfigured. What how they knew who they were? They were identifiable. Moses was identifiable. Elias was identifiable. In fact, old Peter recognized them here. And he says, we're going to build three tabernacles, Lord, one to you and one to Moses and one to Elias. And the voice from heaven spoke. And old Peter got quiet right quick. God said, this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. You listen to him. Hear ye him. But I'd like to say this. Moses was identifiable and Elias was identifiable. And they were on the other side. They'd been dead for many, many years. That's interesting. 
that the Bible would go to the trouble to make this clear that they had not lost their identity. They still were who they were. Uh, look at Luke 16 where Jesus was speaking and he brought up something quite interesting along this line too. In Luke 16 beginning at verse 19 There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Father Abraham's bosom. By the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received us thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father, Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Who's rich man? Who's Lazarus? They were real people that were living upon the face of the earth and Jesus talked about them. What happened to them? They died. Where'd they go? Into the next world. Were they conscious? Yes. Rich man was conscious. Lazarus was conscious. Abraham was there. They had not lost their identity. They knew who they were. They recognized each other. So I'm thinking about what we're saying. We need to come to grips with this and know that we won't need any help to recognize who Jesus is once we get on the other side. He's not going to lose his identity. Well, now we're going to identify Jesus other than some picture or some portrait that, uh, with long hair and a full beard and it looks like a woman. Don't believe the Bible teaches that Jesus had long hair and looked like a woman for one minute. He was a masculine man. He was a man's man. He was not a womanish, feminish person. But that's another story. Well, we're going to be able to recognize Jesus because of the position he's in. And we're going to look into his face and say, Lord, I've been looking to see you for a long time. I'm glad to see you face to face. And you know, if the Bible teaches that we're not going to know each other on the other side, why in the world is this, these facts coming out here? On and on we could go. Uh, we don't have enough time to deal with all the passages that we could look at. Uh, there's another one that can't be passed up. Time flies. Look at Revelation chapter 6. In Revelation chapter 6, beginning at verse 8, the interesting passage here in this last book of prophecy in the Bible, these people here that is being discussed 
who are they? Look what the Bible says about them. In Revelation chapter 6, beginning at verse 8, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. Now notice, after the stage is set here, this pale horse in the book of Revelation is none other than death, the pursuit of death to the human family. Well, I notice some of these people that had been killed by death. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now think about what this says. Where were these souls that had been slain for the word of God? They were under the altar. Were they in a state of suspended animation where they didn't know anything at all? No, they were aware. These souls under the altar, uh, they were even talking. Notice what it says. They cried with a loud voice, if they are in a state of knowing nothing, their non-existence, they're waiting the resurrection of the dead, why in the world would the Bible include the fact that these people were talking, awake? They cried with a loud voice. What did they say? How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? See, these people still back on earth in this passage of scripture that had was still alive in the flesh. <coughs> and these souls are talking and crying out about how long is this going to go on until these other people come on and are with us. I believe you should see the point. You can't deny the fact that when we scrap scripture try to prove our grave sleeping doctrine that the dead don't know anything at all and they're laying there in the cemetery until the resurrection day is just not what the Bible teaches. If you go to a cemetery and you think your loved one's still in that grave, you don't know much about the Bible. I drove all the way to North Carolina to my dad's funeral. As soon as I got in town, I went to cemetery. And it's one of those uh, cemeteries where they're perpetual care and there's no stones above ground, all nothing but a plaque in the ground. And I couldn't find dad's grave plot. It wasn't identifiable. I got over to the house and I said, Mama came by the cemetery but I couldn't find dad's grave you know what my mother said to me she said Ben you know better than that so you know that dad's not over in that grave no he's not in that grave his body is but he's not Ecclesiastes 12 teaches that the spirit goes back to God who gave it there is not one soul in any cemetery on the face of this earth. They have already gone through the grave and they are in Sheol, Paradise, Tartarus. They're already there. Stop coming to grips with this. Well, Brother Burns, you read in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 a minute ago that the dead know nothing at all. Well, look at that verse and uh, time will get by us before we can get through it. Notice what else I read in Ecclesiastes 9. Verse 5 says, The dead know not anything, 
And we've lifted that out of its context and we are saying that those who are in the grave don't know anything at all. Well, where is it that the dead don't know anything? Read the rest of it. They're clear. It establishes that the one event that was common to the whole human family is that they would die. They go to the dead. But notice the rest of the story. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. Notice the, the, the sentence is not closed. But the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Notice the next verse. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done. Where? Under the sun. Where is it the dead do not know anything about? What's going on back here on earth with the sun shining? We buried my grandfather in 1963. I promised him at that graveside that I'd preach the gospel. That's been a long time ago. He has never heard me preach one sermon. He doesn't know that I'm still preaching. He doesn't know what's going on back here on earth with the sun is shining. Those souls under the altar in Revelation chapter 6, they don't know what's going on back here on earth. All this strange stuff we've heard over TV and some of this mystical stuff and hypnotic trances is a bunch of garbage. The Bible teaches that the dead will know who they are, where they are. But they don't know what's going on back here on earth. But they do know what's going on where they are. And they're cognizant. They're full of eternity come to grips with this you know Jesus dealt with this in, uh, in Luke 20 and Matthew 22 and you know one of the things he said was he said he talked to these people who were wanting to know who this woman's husband was going to be in eternity Jesus hit them strong he said first of all he says you do err not knowing the scriptures. He said, you don't know anything about the Bible. Or you wouldn't say things like you say. He said, you do err not knowing the scriptures. Jesus knew what eternity was all about. And we've come to conclusions about things. <clears throat> you know, if we can, can, can rationalize and come up to the conclusion that since these were spiritual beings and that spiritual things apply here in the text of Luke 20 and Matthew 22 we can also conclude then that God is spiritual and Jesus is spiritual and the Holy Spirit is spiritual and we can come to the erroneous conclusions real quick and saying that this passage of scripture here in uh, Luke and Matthew uh, are really just spiritual things. Well, somebody says, and I said, we've got to conclude. Somebody says, well, if I get to heaven and I don't see somebody that I knew, I will automatically conclude that they're in hell. And that won't make me happy. Well, think about that a minute. Uh, is Jesus upset and bothered about people who are not what they ought to be? And will he moan and groan and regret throughout all eternity because certain people rejected his teachings? And didn't do what he said do. And they're lost. I've got family members scattered throughout the 
United States and they're not Christians and they're not faithful am I moaning and groaning and all upset and bothered and can't sleep because they chose to reject Jesus oh I hate it I'd do anything in the world try to encourage them trying to get them to come to this special day coming up in a couple weeks but I can't help the fact that they didn't do what was right they chose to set up their unfaithfulness and if I get over to eternity and, and somebody's not there that I would have hoped would have been there God will give me the grace and the understanding to be able to handle it because he handles it Jesus handles it and Jesus loves the lost a whole lot more than I do because he shed his blood and died for them. And he's not going to be miserable through eternity because somebody chose not to do what was right. Come to grips with this subject. It's something to think about. We had not been touched him the garment so much more than needs to be said. But I believe we've said enough to cause you to stop and think about it. We'll recognize each other in heaven. We'll know each other. We will not lose our identity. We'll still be the people who remember what went back here on earth. And there's many by passages that brings this up. But you know the worst thing of all, and I haven't really mentioned this and I've got to mention it. It's not the issue of whether we'll really know each other in heaven. The issue is will I get there? Will I go? Will you go? Do we really have our hearts set on going to heaven? We expect preachers to talk about it. We expect to sing about it. The truth of the matter is that out there Monday through Saturday we're making decisions in our lives that's going to keep us from going to heaven. Not being faithful not honoring his word not being concerned about people who are not children of God and our families and in our associates if you're subject to the invitation of Jesus and you need to confess him you need to turn away from sin and repentance you need to be baptized into his death where his blood was shed where you can have the forgiveness of your sins would you come to Jesus while we stand together if you have questions or comments concerning today's lesson you may send those to Petersburg Church of Christ, 205 Russell Street, Petersburg, Tennessee, 37144. Or you may email us at petersburgchurchofchrist at hotmail.com. You may also request a copy of today's lesson through the same method. Be sure to include today's date along with the station on which this program aired and the title of the lesson. We hope to see you again next week right here on this station at the same time.